Honest, uh, I think the best way, uh, well, first of all, uh, Steve, you will not go free. At the end of the session, you'll have about uh, 15 minutes for q and I'm going to ask you to join in because I think a lot of the entrepreneurs or startups here would want to know at least some, some things from you. So he would have to come back uh, as a Q&A. So I'll try to rush everything over. I think the best way to go is uh, from left onwards. Uh, he's, he's, oh yeah, this one. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, he's the most senior among us. Uh, uh, as is uh, handling a lot of business here from uh, true asset money and true, obviously, a parent company. So each of you would get about five to seven minutes to explain to us what you're doing, how you're doing, and then I will, after, after uh, Troy, well his nickname is Troy, is done, I'll kick in the Q&A, and then I'll bring Steve along, and then we can all play around with it. I think that's the easier way. More in informal, and, okay, my cup, say hi. Hello, my cup, okay, cup. Yeah, so you have, uh, my name is Punamad, and the most senior being the, the, the oldest, I guess, on this panel. Um, so I'll, uh, while we're bringing up the, the, the PowerPoint presentations, uh, as a group, we uh, came together about three years ago. And our business, the, our mission is to enable digital economy uh, with digital platform and services. We have three key, three key pillars of the business. The first key pillar, which is the focus that I want to share a bit more today, that uh, is uh, asset money, uh, and we use the brand name True Money. Um, that's on the fintech side. Uh, the second pillar is on e-commerce, the both B two B e-commerce and also B two C e-commerce. Um, and this one we process about uh, four billion US dollar uh, annually now. Uh, and then the third leg of the business is the cloud computing the business under the, the brand name True ADC. We operate data center and cloud computing. And fortunately, our clients trust us to be the leader in the market today. Um, where is the slide? Up? Right. Um, so the first pillar of the business is the asset money. Um, and this business is very important to us because it's solving a significant pain point and very meaningful the missions where we want to enable everyone access to innovative financial services so that they have a better life. Um, and our key target segment is, um, one is the underserved, the underbanked segment. The, um, the underbanked and unbanked, these are the ones that have no or very little access to, uh, to banks. And there are a significant portion of them. In fact, um, over 60% of the populations have no access to bank account at all. Um, and another group is people like us, the digital consumers who still find that the existing way of payment um, and do other financial services are not as easy, convenient, um, or worthwhile, beneficial as it could be. Our key market uh, is we currently we in Southeast Asia. We are in six countries uh, where we headquartered in Thailand, we are in Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and, Malibu, uh, and Philippines. Yeah, those are the six countries we operate in. Um, it's a large, huge pain point, 620 million people. As young population, 70% is still under 14, 14 years old. Uh, and some countries like Vietnam and Philippines are super young. About 50% is less than 30 years old. And still growing. You know, this region is still making, making babies. And under right, 60% unbanked. And what we do is that we offer the, we offer the distribution point of financial services the, in three various formats. The mobile wallet for digital consumer. The, it's a, it's a both mobile web and applications. And we have the, 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 the blue portion, which is the non-mobile wallet. These are a self-service or we are our third-party agent, right? For example, 7-Eleven, our kiosk machine. And then the, the, the light green version, which is the agent operation. We set up our own agent throughout Southeast Asia. The, today, we have about close to 200,000 agent network. Uh, and these are the mom and pop shop um, and you know various type of shops that we convert them, uh, franchise them um, to become our agent. Uh, today we process about 2.5 billion and fortunately the, the, the number is still growing quite fast, about 35 to 40% year over year um, processing volume. 
And what we do, uh, we, we do starting for a basic, uh, where the current service we provide do payment. So you can you know, pay all your bills, they were late. Um, you can top up to your mobile digital content app store, that you do peer-to-peer -peer transfer, you do online, offline payment in retail. Um, and we also have a product called prepaid MasterCard, where we enable those that don't have credit card or don't trust credit card to use online to able to pay online. Um, in the future, uh, at, currently at a glance in Thailand, we, uh, we have about 25 million customers, 75 billion baht in transactions volume, and about 4 million uh, in terms of register the wallet user and active about 1 million every month. And our business model, our positioning is very clear. We are the platform that connect the consumers the, to service provider. Today, we, our service provider are the payment service provider, both online and offline payment. In the future, there are other type of the service provider, like lender, investment company, insurance. And what we want to be is that, one of one, we want to replace your wallet, right? You don't need to carry your physical wallet, uh, which is not so smart. We want to be the smart wallet in every hand. And we want to be the, the place that can grow uh, your money, uh, so that uh, given the data that we have, the technology and the security and trust that we create, uh, we, can, we, we can help you to live a better life. Okay, the battery is, I think the battery runs, runs up. Oh, there we go. Um, in other countries outside Thailand, the, where there's a large population of unbanked uh, people, we use the agent network uh, to help create trust. And in every country, we have more locations or more agents than the biggest bank uh, in those particular uh, in those countries. And our basic rule of thumb is that we want to have at least ten times bigger than the biggest bank number of branch. And today we provide the basic services. That uh, will payment remittance. That in the future, that will distribute more, uh, more complicated product. So that's about all for now as an internal introduction. Um, and our mission is to you know be here because we want to make lives of millions, hundreds of millions of people better because we have lived. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we're going uh, right to the next set. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. So I'm going to use my own iPad. Sorry, one second. Okay, thanks. Let's see. Is it up? Okay, here we go. So, hi everyone, my name is Mo Natarut. So, um, I'm the CEO and founder of OOP. So, OOP is a digital platform we start by doing ebooks. Now today we are doing uh, everything, including like music, comics, uh, novel, and also we just start a video platform. And so uh, I started my company five years ago, and now it has been uh, at the CVC level. Our latest investor is the Tencent, the maker of uh, WeChat. I also happen to run a uh, 500 startups fund in, in Thailand, which is like a 15 million US dollars fund, and we. Um, concentratingly investing in particularly in Thai startups. So in the past 18 months, I have invested in over 35 companies, and our plan is to invest in up to 100 companies in Thailand alone. As an investor, 500 startup invest in a lot of uh, companies, um, 1,800 companies around the world to be exact. Twilio is happen to be one of our unicorn, as well as Grab. So both Twilio and Grab is one of our portfolio in, in the, from the, among the companies that we invested. Uh, and then there are other 30 companies that uh, be in the size over 100 million US dollars. And okay, let's, let's come back to group B. <laughs> so, so we have around 300 people now, and we have office in Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines, and recently Indonesia. And at the moment, we are growing much faster. We are growing about 25,000 new uh, users per day. And I have around 8 million uh, people actively using our service every month um, uh, in Southeast Asia. The service we provide basically is uh, e-books, e-magazines, and uh, newspaper online. Also like a subscription model. So, so in every country, we have a model where people can pay just like 10 US dollar a month, and it's all, all, all they can read. We also provide a service like 
uh, recently we've been moving on to to the trend that's called user-generated content. So I believe that in reality we are living in a world where people is creating their own internet. So back in like 10 years ago, right, you used to, to have a service like Sendit.com or Yahoo.com where people dictate what you have to read according to their their uh, editor idea or newspaper or magazines. But nowadays, what you are consuming in day-to-day -day life is actually you are the one who created it. For example, if you are playing Instagram, you start looking at, uh, it like, for example, you love fashion, you start following people who love fashion, and then one day you start posting photos related to fashion. The same for Facebook, the same for YouTube. So when I open my own YouTube, my YouTube is actually different from you guys, right? So, so people look only uh, see what they want now. So that's the whole idea of our, our company future where we start uh, moving our company in a user-generated uh, uh, direction. And that's, that's moving so fast. So I have around 200,000 creators on, on my hand now, which is like a, a comic, uh, comic drawers, it's like a writers, music band, bloggers. And this is my, my community, which is like comics, novel, uh, video, which is I co found with the ex live founder. So he, uh, it's a video community and uh, uh, also a music community. Each community we monetize differently, depends on the kind of business. For example, for music, it's very difficult to charge money for people to listen to music anymore. Everyone listens to music on YouTube. Uh, uh, nowadays, the most popular apps in Southeast Asia is called Jukes, which is like a music and streaming platform, which is also belong to, to Tencent. And uh, let me move it up so fast. Okay, let, let, let me show you a little and you get an idea. Maybe I still have like five minutes. So, so if you are tired, you you you, you kind of get what I what I mean. For example, like this one once again. Thank you. So this this is a website called called uh, Ubi Comics. So when you go in, right, you see a lot of comics on on all all of these comics actually drawn by Thai teenagers or Thai artists. You used to read like like Japanese comics and then they import that to Thailand, but now today all this is actually developed by, by Thai comics. You, you see like like this story, right? It say my love starting at 7 Eleven. <laughs> like, like the story is so local you can relate it to, right? And then when you look at this story, it's it has been read by 16 million times. You know? We are living in a world where bestseller, bookseller in Thailand, right, best author, they print only a couple thousand, I don't know, like 30,000, for example, 30,000 copies put on a bookstore and then they say that this is the bestseller books already. But, but comics that are written by these kids have been read, uh, read by tens of millions of time and we have like thousands and thousands of these comics. You already know that where the future is. And then, and then the story is so, is so local. For example, if you look at the, the, popular, the popular pictures that people uploaded, you see, it, what is this? This is like a, the TV story called Mass Singer. It's really like, popular in Thailand now. Every week when the episode ends, right, there will be hundreds of kids drawing my singer uh, icon that they like and upload. So, so it's real time, it's user generated, and it's really engaged to, 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 to people. So, so in charge, yes, yeah, so this is uh, kind of like what we, are, what we are doing now. And the last part I, I probably would like to, to show is the for music, maybe you get like what's going on in, in, in music this day. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will skip to just the part that, that I think is the other thing. So, so again, again for music, so we have like an online streaming platform uh, dedicated for indie musicians in, in Thailand. So we link to all like local musicians and then they can upload their local band and then we may monetize money by organizing concerts. We did 11 concerts last year, which is our first year. And this is what this looks like. Each concert, there will be thousands of people coming and they do like food market. And this is an actual picture from, from, from our concert, which is, this is our user generated content where people upload their song and then they, they generate their fan online. And then every quarter we, all the people who listen to this music and then we organize sponsor a uh, concert with sponsorship because sponsor like uh, uh, alcohol, beverage, etc. 
and then, and then we, we actually made millions of US dollars uh, on sponsorship for these kind of events. So, so this is all will be now. Yeah, I'm gonna pass what we are uh, what next to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Yao, uh, he's flown in from Singapore for this event, and I think like like Steve himself, please introduce yourself, and I guess he's given some introduction of who you are. All right, sure. Well, let me see if the slides come up. Um, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about Tornado first, uh, since you probably will not be as familiar with Tornado, but mostly working behind the scenes, uh, behind a lot of the applications and software that you might be using today. So a lot of our panelists here, you know, they are facing uh, the consumer market. We are more of an enterprise company. Um, we also work with developers, but different kind of developers from what Property Guru and Steve work with. We work with programmers, right? The developers, programmers, software engineers is who we work with. Um, and what Twilio is fundamentally is that we are a cloud platform, right? That allows you to build communications into your applications and your software. So you are, you are a programmer, you need to be able to send a text message, you need to be able to make a voice call, you need to view in-app chat, you need to view conversational commerce, you need to be able to do video within your application, within your software. You can do that very easily by connecting into Twilio in the cloud. You don't really need to set up any hardware. You pay for what you use and you're up and running right away. Right? So we have customers who build their entire software communication applications on us within three days. Right? If you know what you're doing, you can get up and running within half an hour. So it's a very, very easy to use uh, platform. And the idea behind Twilio is basically this. And this. What we are trying to do is to bridge between these two worlds. Right? So that's the telecom world with, you know, telecom networks are pretty much closed network. Every telecom company runs their own network. Right? They have very different protocols like SS7, SIP, SFTP, things that we very esoteric, industry-specific protocols that we are not familiar with, right, as the man on the street, right? It's very long to get set up with a carrier. So if you go to, you know, DTAC or AIS or True Today, and you're a company, and you're a startup, and you go there and tell them, oh, you know, I'd like to be able to send 100 messages a month because I'm a 10-man startup, and I'm building this application, and I need to send one time password, right? They will tell you, Sorry, I'm not able to serve you, right? Because you're just too small, right? And that was the problem that we had as a small company, right? When we started as a company um, way, way earlier, we had difficulty getting in and talking to the carriers. And so that was a problem that we set out to solve uh, starting in the US, right? And so we connect with the telecom companies on one side, and then on the other side, we provide the service in the cloud through a very easily consumable method uh, on the API basis to everybody who is a developer. So you can go to Twitter.com, you sign up for an account, you can get set up right away, you can start sending SMS, you can start making voice call. Very easy, and it's in the programming language that developers will be very familiar with. Ruby, Python, PHP, JavaScript, you know, all the SDKs you need for iOS and Android. Very, very easy to use. You don't need to set up any hardware. You don't need to you know, sign any contracts. And so you can be up and running very quickly. So that's the underpinning concept behind Twilio as a company and went to today. This is pretty much what we do, right? This is pretty much you know, underpins all the different products that we have on our website. And so, you know, as a company, we are very beneath the surface, right? We are more of an infrastructure company, uh, but it's very likely that you might have used uh, Twilio before, right? If you look at sort of uh, the number of uh, customers that we have, we have 36,000 enterprise customers. A lot of these companies will be very familiar to you, right? We work with Google and Facebook and Netflix and Salesforce and Amazon. You know, in this part of the world, we work with Grab, we work with Uber, we work with Gojek, you know, we power a lot of the communications that these companies are using, right? Um, so if if you got an SMS from WhatsApp, you know, we might be sending that SMS to you, right? When we last counted the number of devices, right, the number of smartphones or regular phones that we touch in 2015, we were touching about a billion uh, different devices around the world. 
And so today, we have about 36,000 customers. We have about a million developers. Uh, and to just bring home the example, um, you know, I, I like to use the example of Uber. So most companies are, most, most people are very familiar with Uber. Uh, or Grab, you know, all of them use us the same way, or Lyft. Uh, in the US, they use us in a very similar way. So the way we power Uber uh, is two ways, right? It's the communication part of it. So now, when you receive an SMS from Uber, that SMS is delivered by us, right? There's notification SMS, the ones that you see on the screen. Very straightforward notification SMS. Behind the scene, we'll be working with you know, AI as the tech and true to de deliver that onto your headset, right? The other way that we work with Uber is, and this is, this is not deployed in Thailand, uh, and Uber you know, has, been, has suspended their service in Thailand, uh, but if you make a, take an Uber ride in the US or you take an Uber ride in Singapore, you will notice that the number is connected through a number that is actually not the driver's number when you call the driver. So we actually connect that call on behalf of Uber using a number that is actually a Twilio number. And the reason they want to do this is to protect the privacy of the driver and the passenger, right? So there have, you know, there have instances of harassment in the past where, you know, when you caught the, when the driver caught the passenger directly, the passenger mobile number will come up. And that becomes a problem if you are a you know, very important person and suddenly your mobile number is not in the hands of the driver, right? And so to protect the privacy of, you know, the, dri the driver and the passenger, Uber and Grab and Gojek and a lot of these companies are beginning to launch this service, which is what we call number masking, right? It uses a third party number and they program that using a Twilio number, they program that on Twilio, and they basically program that uh, very easily. They throw it out in one country, and when they go to another country, they can just get the number from Twilio in that country, and they're up and running. They don't have to redevelop the whole thing again, right? And we take care of all the connection, interconnection with the carriers, with our carrier partners in each and every single one of those countries. <laughs> so that is a very high level, um, you know, introduction to Twilio as a company. Um, you know, as as uh, the, our friend here has mentioned, uh, they have invested in, Fire Startups actually invested in <laughs> Twilio. Way, 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 uh, that was like seed stage. The company actually started in uh, 2008, that was when Dave, uh, the founder of Fire Startups, actually invested in uh, Twilio. So we, as a company, we've been around for nine years now. So, and uh, the company actually went public on the New York Stock Exchange last year. Uh, so that was a big milestone uh, for us. Um, personally, I've still working with the company for half that time. Uh, so actually, interestingly, I was also an investor in the company. Uh, and that was how I started working with the company. And then subsequently, they were looking to expand into Asia. Um, and at that time, in 2014, we weren't doing anything in Asia. And so I joined the company in San Francisco and it was helping them to expand and deploy into Asia. And so today we have 13 offices around the world, two in Asia, uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore. We also have a partner that we work with in Japan, and we are opening up offices in other parts of Asia. And very much looking forward to working with you know, everybody in Asia, especially the startup community, which is actually a big part of um, you know, who, what makes us successful, right? You know, a lot of people ask us, you know, now that Uber is a very, very big company, a lot of people ask us, you know, how did you sell to Uber? And the truth of the story is that we never sold to Uber. So we are a platform business. When Uber started using Twilio, they were a dead man startup, right? They were nowhere, right? They, nobody would have entertained them. AT&T, Verizon, would not have entertained them. And they needed to test, at that time, a black car service, literally what you see here. That was what they started with, right? So they were a startup, they, were, they weren't anybody, and they needed a test of that car service, they need to send SMS to the drivers, and they needed something easy to use, they found Twilio. And then we started working with them, and so they from, went from one city to 50 to 100 cities across the US, we scaled with them. And then when they went from one country, and they went to 50 countries around the world, and we scaled with them. And so we, we continue to scale and help them build up the infrastructure across the world, and anybody who uses Twilio basically uses the same infrastructure that, that Uber is using today. Yeah. And so we are, we are extremely excited always to work with the Slack community because that is actually 
very close to our heart, right? We uh, actually, you know, that reminds us a lot of you know, where we come from, uh, and you know, we want to be very supportive of the community. Thank you. Troy, uh, he's, he's the youngest one among us here, and one of the only, only uh, startup who's, I think, in a very short time, about a year and a half, has managed to uh, have a cash flow break even. I was surprised. Um, let's hear him, his story in about five minutes, and then I'll shoot questions to all of you. Please, go ahead. Thank you very much. So, hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Troy, uh, co-founder of Globish. So, um, I think the event is called Learning from the Unicorn, right? And please call me a pony. I'm unicorning my company. So, sooner, we'd like to say, you know, uh, in portfolio of 500 as well very soon, hopefully. And uh, let's see what we can learn from the pony here. Uh, Lopish is a two years old company, so we are the platform that uses internet for Thai people to connect to the foreigner around the world to learn the, to learn English, to get motivated, and to have a, a good relationship and have a global mindset to be able to understand English in a different perspective. Let me share with how I first started this. So about a few years ago, I was in the global internship industry. I was sending Thai students and Thai youths to do internship around the world and to do volunteer as well. I found out that we, a lot of Thai talent didn't get selected and it's the main reason is a lot of English. But when I check the CV, when I check the profile, they all have a high score, you know, like IELTS, TOEIC, TOEFL, but still, you know, not many companies selected them and a lot of my friends who work in the big company struggling a lot to become a manager and to get a higher position. So let's say we have 12 years of learning English. You know, this is still a national problem here. So yeah, so I figured out with my friend how we're gonna solve this. And we believe that how we're gonna solve it is that Thai people have to like English. And in, if you are a Thai people, you know, you only do a good job in your class when you like the teacher. And the relationship is very important. When you learn English with, you know, 50 people, 40 people in the class, and then when you raise up their hand, and then you, you didn't speak well, and people laugh at you, you wouldn't want to learn English again. Yeah, so we use internet to solve this problem, and this is how we do it. <coughs> yeah, so, oops, sorry. So, uh, the student would apply the Globish course to our website, and then our team will call you on a mobile phone and then ask you, you know, why you want to learn English? Or what is your motivation, what's your goal? And then we motivate them to learn the course that they are uh, most suitable in the English level. And then you can select your time, you can select your uh, date that you want to learn. Only three hours, and we connect you live one-on-one -on -one with the foreigner around the world. And then you will practice your English, and we have a pre-test, and we have a post-test. And then uh, in the end, you get a certificate if you uh, pass to our early roles. The key, sorry, the key definition itself is, is not a grammar class, it's very outcome oriented, it's cost effective and it's very convenient. Yeah. And also we didn't teach you, you know, completely English class, we call it Globish because it's global English. So you get to learn more, we focus on speaking, speaking, practical speaking, so you don't have to learn the whole dictionary. And last but not least, it saves your time. You don't have to learn for two years, six months, three days a week, and it's much, much cheaper than going to the to other school that have you through. Yeah, so two years old, ca positive cash flow, thanks to Mesh for mentioning that. We have about 2,000 students learning with us. At this moment that we are talking, that's about 500 students, you know, connecting in our platform, learning English. Yeah, we work with Grab as well, and we were the, the winner of the like the local shark tank in Thailand last year, and we are growing and uh, hope one day we will become a unicorn. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, this is, that, these are the kind of people we need. We need the young generation. Uh, I try to get the also the, the experienced one, two experienced one, one who is pretty successful, but. The, the would-be next unicorn of Thailand uh, 
Yeah, basically, good move is the call. Yes, yes, it's so the down. Okay, yes. So, yeah, it, so they, they have they have gone through some ups and downs. Um, if I can, if I can start with you, Kunmu. Uh, I'm sorry if I can use your nickname. Uh, that would sounds too formal, right? Kunmu, uh, the closing down is is what Rob had ex explained earlier as well. Is when they closed down the initial thing that started in 2004, 2005. How does it feel to start something and then shut it off and say, okay, this is not working? I mean, usually it's pretty normal for a startup when we try something and it's not working, so you have to, to move on fast. But in, in, in this case, for the mall uh, in particular, we, we did invest a lot. Actually, I lost over 3 million US dollar last year. When we, it's basically uh, B2B, which is totally digital content platform. And then a couple of years back, people were talking about Alibaba, e-commerce is coming. And then I was thinking, hey, actually my CAC is so low. It is so cheap for me to get user on our platform using digital. And my thesis is that it is possible for me to actually start selling stuff to these people, like, like actual stuff. So, so I raised another round and then tried to use that money to, to explore the, the e-commerce business. Uh, so now it's not, so, so the company is losing a lot of money. And then it's come to the point that we, we decided, hey, actually, we better use this couple more million US dollars in our digital business. So, so I have to let go of almost 90 people in my company earlier this year, which is, which is tough because, because many of them have personally go out and have dinner with them and pull them out from their stable income jobs and, and get to work. So, so I learned a lot, I learned a lot. On the digital side, we are doing really, really well. But, but on the e-commerce side, it's tough, and then that's that's where I have to make a tough decision. Yeah. And and I hope there's no conflict of interest there. You're using a five minute startup to finance your own project. Um, no, we don't. We don't. We need never up for the fund my own project, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure. Um, in terms of if, again, I had I had a few questions for you, and I'll move on to everybody here. Is that a bad harbinger? Is that a bad news for? Oh, there are loads of people I know who are into this uh, retail startup where they use their IG, they use their FB, sorry, Instagram, Facebook, uh, all these social media applications to sell products to, and they think they can actually make a difference by launching an online mall, an online product. With your experience, would you, would, what kind of uh, lesson do you think you have learned that you can share with many of us, possibly successful ones, uh, or who are looking to do that kind of business? What kind of lesson would you have you learned to tell these people that, hey, this is this could be a wrong step because it's very competitive. That uh, people people like Lazada would kill you. You know, there are loads of all these people who are there who could kill you. Yeah. So so you have to separate these two two things. So if you are the the, the small store selling stuff on Instagram and then like chat uh, chat commerce online. I think there's always been an opportunity on that because we already got your distribution channel like Instagram, people use Instagram every day and then people, everyone use Line to communicate. And then you just, you just have to improve on your product selection and shipping and price, of course. But as a platform, like what we are trying to do is actually we try to compete with big players, trying to create our own channel to sell. So this is, this is where we have to invest a lot in going to do the, the, the retail platform. So, so, so back to your question, I think for the small players, as long as you stick to the bigger platform, including people like Lazada, you will be okay, yeah. But the smaller ones could, could be in trouble. Smaller one who very want to be- yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Very small ones are okay. Very small ones are okay. Very small ones, okay. Um, the small ones who want to be create our own platform, probably in trouble. That's a different one. Yeah. Moving, shifting gears, uh, um, sorry, you, you said, well, questions for you as well. Um, you said that uh, the industry has a potential here and truly there is a huge potential in all aspects. You said you have uh, four billion dollars, if, if I remember correctly, is it for, for the for the B2B and B2C and your uh, FinTech is 2.5 billion, that's that's 6.5 billion dollars. Did I get the maths right? Yeah, I mean there, there's some overlap obviously, right, because we, the, um, the e-commerce, the, um, that's the sales volume. Yeah, that, that goes through, and a good part, um, and a good part of it, we process the payment as well. So there's some overlap. So that means this is the reason why Alibaba came and bought into you twenty <laughs> percent. Um, well, 
the uh, Ali, Ruba, Ali, Ali Pay. And Ali Pay, sorry, and, and, and financial, and, sorry, my bad. Um, uh, and, and financial is, is a minority partner in our company, and it's I think it's, it's a few things, right? One is that, that they see the alignment in terms of our mission uh, to what they would like to achieve. And uh, secondly, it's about the alignment of culture. You know, I think um, Ant Financial is it's the obviously very interesting company, but one of their key aspects is that um, they really look into the culture of the company because they say that um, you, you can buy any companies, but if the company doesn't have alignment of culture, you, can, you, you get divorced very quickly. Right. So I think and financial, they, 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 I think they, they, they see the alignment on the culture aspect as well. Um, and the third is the, is the value add on the commercial side of things as well, right? That we become a part of their global network uh, so that our wallet users can go to China uh, in the near future without having to exchange uh, into Chinese yuan. Um, and vice versa, Chinese come into Thailand and be accepted anywhere except through money wallet. So the, 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 at the moment, it's just basically Pan Gun or it's just Chief Gun. So that's going to be mar married soon, isn't it? You said that they're going to take another 10%. You said if the alignment is not right, then they will separate, divorce. So this is going to get marriage, isn't it? It's heading towards marriage. Because you had made a statement where you said that uh, Ant Financial is going to take up another 10% uh, within this year, if I remember yeah. correctly. Sure, yeah, they, they, they have the options of increase the state in our company. And how much did they pay for for the twenty percent? Right. Oh, you, you know the answer. You can't disclose that. <laughs> Sorry, I had to I had to try my luck. He's not disclosed the uh, the the money he got from the company, and that has actually uh, made people wonder what your valuation of the company is because at the last count, if I remember, it was uh, it was about one hundred eighty, one hundred thirty million dollars or something, and which which is ridiculously low. Because but anyway, would you would you would you say you are you are the next unicorn? Would you, would you take away the the crown from Kun <laughs> Um I, that's that's not a goal we look forward to, right? So um, so I don't know if it happens, then it's great. You have no aims for it, is it? No, I mean it's it's a byproduct of if we do great things for our customers, then the, you know the, someone will value us accordingly. Yeah, but we, we, we don't do you don't do the numbers, so who, who could value? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you see, you, you're handling the entire region uh, for for as a as a as a you know all the developers, and you said you have about thirty six thousand enterprise customers and a million developers. Um, how do you see the growth in this region? With many of us sitting here looking to enter this kind of uh, um, the new era of growth. Where do you see the growth coming from? Which, which part of this region, as I may say, apart from China, which has obviously gone way beyond? Is it going to be Thailand? Is it going to be Malaysia? Is it going to be Indonesia? Is it going to be India? Is it going to be Myanmar? Where do you see the growth? Vietnam, where? You know, the, the truth is we see it in all these locations, right? And a lot of it is that there are a lot of people uh, who has aspirations to be entrepreneurs, right? The hurdle for you to come out and do your own thing is a lot lower than right? We have you know, a lot of folks in this room who are going out to do their own things. We have people who have done it very successfully um, in Thailand. And we see that literally in every single market, every single country uh, that we go to, right? Which is also why we see our usage happen in every single market. And then what's interesting is that as the barriers and borders between countries are you know, collapsing, it's a lot easier for us to go from one country to the next country. There's a lot of global platforms, right? There's a lot of stuff that we use that's very common across the region, right? We use Facebook, we use Line, we use WhatsApp, we use Instagram. They're very common platforms that allows us to break apart barriers and go from one place to the next place, right? We have a lot of translation tools that we can use today to help us translate if we need to. Uh, so it's a lot easier for us to go from region to region. And so we actually see that growth across all the different countries in Southeast Asia, across Asia. And you're, you're, you're immune to the issues such as government regulations because oh, you're yeah, using that regulation. plat platform. So. <laughs> so, so the regulations we touch is actually the telecom regulations, which is even more like heavily regulated. Uh, so we actually spent a lot, a lot, a lot of my energy is spent on working with our carrier partners, our telecom partners, uh, to figure out what the regulations are, that's actually the, the most difficult part, right? Every single country 
as a different um, regulation. And we sort of sit in the cloud. And then at the back, we work with our telecom partners. Um, so we try to make it as a consistent experience because you, as a consumer or as a company or as a programmer, you, you just want to send a message, a text message, or send, a, send an SMS. You just want to make a voice call. You don't really want to think about the whole problem of, right, okay, maybe this country doesn't allow you to send SMS between, like India is a good example. India doesn't allow promotional marketing messages between 9 a.m. and uh, after 9, a, 9 p.m. and before 9 a.m., right? It has and very strict and, and no calls allowed. You're not supposed to call at no, all. No, yeah, yeah. as well, correct. So no calls allowed, no SMS allowed. Very, very strict uh, rules around that, right? And so we try to extract all this complexity and make it easy for our customers. But that means we deal with that telecom regulation, right? And uh, there's a lot of it. <laughs> we have a lot of, uh, we have quite a few legal counsel around the world helping us. Thank you. The pony, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he called himself a pony, so what's my what's I'm calling him? Hopefully he becomes a unicorn uh, in the near future. But um, sorry, I'm going to be very blunt here. You had told me earlier when I first asked you to join this panel that you you had trouble entering a certain market. I'm not going to name that non-market. You can name it yourself. Um, and I'm going to go back to this question. Is going to bounce back to. Uh, and Kunmo as well. Uh, basically, entering that new market that you wanted to enter, you face some problems. Uh, if I remember correctly, you said the banking problem, the transactional banking problem that you had there, that took forever to open a bank account. Um, can you shed some light what you learned from that? And Kunmo and Kunmo as well. You said you, are, you have operations in Myanmar, um, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Philippines, both of you, uh, and Indonesia, Fokambu, Jamaica. Um, what kind of uh, differences in the markets do you see? But first, the pony first, and then, and then we'll go that way. Tell you how. Right. There's two markets that are very challenging for us. One of them be kind of like, not saying give up, but like postponing. But the end, the other one is really restructuring. So if you leave it as a question mark, not mentioning that it's an international market, but as a in Indonesia that we were trying to approach last year. But actually, I was telling you it's a banking issue. But, but banking issue is it's an excuse. It's not a real reason. <laughs> the real reason is that um, we 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 talk a lot with our venture capital. We say, you know, I got a I got a friends. I got I got a bright mindset of how to open international. I worked for international organization before. I was so confident. But you know, when, when it really happened, I, I need to go back and listen to my venture capital that startup, it had to do with a lot of context. Like people behavior, people mindset. So people learn English in Thailand, even though it's an exact same content, but they're not going to consume in the same way they consume in Vietnam and in Indonesia and in other markets. So we kind of postpone until we have more insight, when we have more know-how, and when we have the right person there, so we'll begin again. But another challenge mar challenging market that we're not giving up and we are really strive for that is a corporate market in Thailand. Right now, about 85% of our students are from retail, from B2C. But when it comes to uh, business sector, it's totally different. Because you know the buyer and the learner are not the same, and the corporate in Thailand, I think you will agree, it very much get used to the old way of learning English, like having one teacher coming to the to the company, learn one, you know, with one teacher, 20, 40 students, or you pay for the very cost-effective e-learning class that the employee learn with from computer. So we will be introducing a new way. We, we kind of have difficulty under explaining the value and how much word it is that is much more effective with a little higher price. And yeah, we, if anyone knows how to do it, please come and teach me. I really need to learn so, that. So basically you're saying the corporate sector, the mindset has not changed because the CEOs and the, the management still remains the ancient uh, 50 plus 60 years old and they still think that the, the way things should go should be the traditional way of having a teacher come in. Well, I wouldn't blame the market. I, I would say myself, understanding, but haven't been able to get a product fit yet. So, once you think, thinking away. Yeah. Ah, 
So for us, we, we scale six country in about in within about a year time frame, and it's it's a huge challenge um, on on three key fronts. That one is the business that we are in is require license, right? We cannot just go in and operate the payment without license. So we, we need to work through the um, we will, first we need to research the market well, and uh, luckily we we make a very conscious decisions that that we need to buy companies. Uh, so we acquire companies that already have license that shortcut us. Um, uh, just to give you a data point, uh, PayPal, right? PayPal has been in, in, in Southeast Asia for 14 years, and they haven't got license outside Singapore. So for us to do a regional ambitions, because the pain point there, and therefore the opportunity is there, uh, we, we went out and acquired company. So that's, that's our strategy. Um, number two is about having the right playbook. The white right playbook is basically how do you scale your business across different countries. My advice to any um, you know, ambitious entrepreneur to regional company is that unless you get the playbook down, don't expand yet. Because that would just burn you, right? But, uh, and I think Steve honestly um, you know, shared with us. Um, and, and really, you know, it, and, and for us, you know, we, we got the playbook, we thought we got the playbook down, but it's still very, very difficult. Uh, and when you see companies that have scaled successfully, almost with no exception, they have very, very clear playbook. Uber is, Uber is one example. They have clear playbook. They go to one country, they hire three persons, uh, one GM, well, one person deal with regulatory, and one person deal with marketing. I think something along that line, right? And they send the three people to Florida to train. Two weeks, they come back, download the app, and out they go. No exception. Just like that, right? And that's, that's the way that uh, I think you need to scale, right? You can't just say that, okay, we'll give flexibility in every country, then things will just go completely out of whack because there's so many variables. So that's the second component, which is um, have the right playbook. And third is have the best country manager you possibly find. That's right? expensive. It can be, but um, I, I was reading in, in uh, LinkedIn this morning, you think um, a, a good, um, architecture, uh, uh, you know, enterprise architecture expensive, try a bad one, right? You know, just like a country leader, if you think they're expensive, try a bad one, then, then you know it's really, really expensive the, of, 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 of the damage. The, um, so we always make a very conscious decisions that take the best country leader possible, give them the playbook, and, and then um, let them scale. Is that the reason why we've been successful so far? Well, we, we're not successful yet. <laughs> Okay, so, so in my case, talking about Southeast Asia, for example, um, I always tell myself and also my, my portfolio companies, when investors, they tend to look at Southeast Asia, they tend to look at us as a one region, right? Maybe when you talk like 600 something million people, only after Facebook, India, and China, people come into the US. But in reality, Southeast Asia is not the same region. We, we speak different languages, different religions, and the cultures are super different in every country. In, in my case, for example, we do a lot of user-generated content. I show, I show you this kind of comics that people draw. The same thing cannot be shown, for example, if you if you off the limit and then you put it in, in Indonesia, you go to jail because there is a law that you cannot upload some some content there, for example. So so it is super difficult for us to, to, to know exactly what is the real uh, root culture in that country as an as a outsider. So we end up acquiring some companies like Panama, of course, that, that is the fastest way. And then, so that is, I think that is the only way, or if you are lucky, you can find a really good local partners where you can really work in closely with them. That, 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 is, that is really lucky. And, and as a small startup, if you don't have a resource to, to acquire or really finding a really strong partner, I suggest uh, what I try in some country in the beginning, it just hire someone there but you don't open an office yet. So I just hired them from, from Bangkok, for example, so I can learn the culture from them, and I kind of like have my manager in Thailand who can control to that guy. Instead of just go there and open an office at a GM, I found out as the most important thing is to engage the, this way and to learn about the GM himself. Is it the right fit or not before you go in and open so an you office? Also the most expensive and the best managers? Like yes, yes, yeah, but with our, with our like, legal entity in that country, I think, I think that is the, the, the Do you have, do you have a book 
white book or to say, okay, these are the key things that they, you should do? So, yeah, so, my, 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 yeah, so my white book now is like, okay, in your country, I'm gonna hire a GM, and then, but I don't open the company yet, and I will let him figure out things until I am sure that, okay, we can do that before we start anything bigger there. Yeah. Great. Steve, I would, I would like to uh, ask you to join because I will open the, uh, the uh, question, floor for the questions. Uh, if anybody has questions for any one of us except me, including Steve, um, feel free and I would love to encourage people to ask because obviously each person has a different set of expertise and, and it's the best way to learn. So, if anybody questions? Leave a hand on top. There you go, there's a gentleman, gentleman there. ครับเอ่อจะติดถามคุณเอ่อคุณทอยนะครับว่าในเรื่องของประสานผิดเนี่ยเราเองบอกว่าเราไม่ใช่ซอฟต์แวร์ทําไมคนพูดไม่ได้
Um, um, it, it, it depends. It depends on, on, on your business and your objective, right? I mean, if you, the, if you sell to, um, if you sell to consumer or you sell to businesses, it's a different channel. Um, a lot of people now say, say, hey, let's go online, go digital, go digital. Um, if your customer can be reached digitally in a cost-effective way, um, then yes, do it digitally, right? But many companies start realizing that the digital is no, is, is no cheaper than traditional, okay? The, um, you need to do it right. So you, you must always start first that what is the objective of your company? If your company only sells to a handful of local business, just hire one salesperson, walk the door. That's the best way to reach the, um, your target customer in this age, right? But if you are, uh, if you are a very selected customers that they are online and they are a bit nicher, a more niche, uh, then, uh, then digital uh, could be right and, and you need to optimize it. There's a lady out there raising her hand. Come on, come on. You go on, huh? ladies first. Sorry. Hi, um, I'm Yvonne. Um, so I'm staying for an I've been living in Bangkok for three years. I have uh, quit my corporate job recently and I've been lawyer for 10 years. So I've always read different books and you know, think about different ideas. That's why I quit my corporate job as a lawyer. And uh, I find that there are many ideas and I have zillions of ideas. I think some people here that I know of know there are lots of ideas. But it's like difficult to understand, like, because I do not come from an IT technical background, and I have lots of good ideas. So I picked, like, with uh, one of the speakers said, you have partnered with a technical person, and then try to make a portfolio, like a prototype, and then you play with maybe 10 of your closest friends, make it very confidential, uh, not, maybe the need to sign an NDA, and then you try to probably sell it to or pitch it to a virtual uh, venture capitalist. So how successful, because I'm doing it as we speak now. And um, I, think it's a very, I think it's a very good idea because I've done 10 ideas and I think it's the best. So maybe to any of the speakers, like how, what is the reality? Maybe four months of trying prototype, improve it two times. Um, how many venture capitals you, you have to go through? What do you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, because I'm going to read it, you know, for, for the second time, actually. So, yeah, maybe share some personal experience. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll bounce this question to many people here. First and foremost, I'll bounce it to the unicorn on, on this panel. So, unicorn, the real unicorn. I don't feel like a unicorn, I feel like a very old dinosaur. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I think the first thing to say is um, congratulations on taking the, the big leap. You know, as a, as a founder who's gone through this process, you know, it's really, really tough to go from a corporate environment to starting a business and having the conviction to go and do that. So you should be very proud about trying. And, and uh, so, you know, congratulations for making the move. Um, and it, by the way, I think it's also a very lonely job uh, being a founder. So, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have someone who I could bounce ideas off. And, despite the fact that we are polar opposites from a psychometric point of view. Uh, all, all the boxes are very different. Uh, we have the same vision. But um, if you don't have that, then uh, I think you know, it's, it can be very lonely. So I think the first thing to say would be to try and find some kind of support group that exists, whether that's an incubator or that's a startup community, where you can kind of share a little bit of bounce ideas off. Uh, because that keep, keeps you going. It certainly did in my case, when the times got really bad, you, know, you have someone to bounce the ideas off. I think in terms of your golden answer for how long does it take, I don't think there is a real right or wrong answer. You will know whether you think it's right or not. Do you have the heart or not to do it? Um, I think I invest in, in uh, small businesses myself and um, want businesses that uh, start off with an idea and straight away are trying to raise fun funding. For me, it's not something which uh, I'm particularly interested in. I want to see the fact that someone's had some conviction, put some weight behind it themselves, put some skin in the game, and, and given it a real good go, and 
and then talk to, to investors. Um, I've also shut down businesses as well, which was very, very hard, but that, that, that took two years of trying in my case, of trying to make the business a success, pivot to one way, pivot to another way, pivot to loans. Our loan, our loan business uh, in Singapore in 2011 to 2012 ended up shutting that down uh, because it was heavily loss making. And that was a very painful process to go through. So I don't think it's a right or wrong answer. In terms of how many investors you speak to, um, it's not a, it's not an easy process. I think, from my own experiences, you have to kiss a lot of frogs uh, before you find a prince or princess. Uh, it's not an easy process. So yeah, you've got to, you've got to meet a lot of people. You've got to refine your pitch and just keep going on that. Um, but personally, I would like to see the more, you know, traction or something for I personally invest in in a business. Thank you. Uh, could another word? Could more? Uh, are you the, the frog? <laughs> yeah, no, Can she yeah. come to you and then... Definitely. You know. yes. so, so we are 500 uh, dog so we, I talk to like at least 30 startups every month, like face-to-face like -face or like, like, like over like, like... So then you gotta wait another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, anyway, so, so back to my, my um, recommendation. Um, in case of trying an idea, like the practical one I think I can recommend is that even before you start to develop a single line of code or try to find the technical co-founders, now today probably the more effective way is just try that idea right away. Every single idea you have on Facebook, you just open one Facebook page and then you just do something that not scale, but you just want to prove your, your IT business idea that is practical or not. You can write an article and then you, you try selling something. And then on Facebook, actually there are so many people using Facebook every day, right? So you don't have a problem with trying to like, ask someone to use the platform. And then you can advertise on Facebook as low as like 500 Thai baht. And then you can space uh, like the age group, you can get education, male, female interest, wrote into your post and look and say that, okay, if you're interested, comment on the comments. And then you learn right away within 30 minutes. And then you start to know that the idea that you want to tackle is actually when you launch it to the market, are there anyone who gonna use it or not? And then if you try, if you can sell something, just sell on it right away to know that how much they are willing to pay and then when they pay, is your service is working. And when you keep doing it uh, for like a couple of months and then if you think it's really, really okay, then you start to try to scale it in a technical platform. So, so probably that is one one of the easiest way I can recommend anyone before just like, okay, I have an idea, I got to find my co-founder, there are a lot of things for a couple of months talking to VC. None of that's gonna happen unless you really crack the problem that the service you're making is someone is really want to buy it or not. So, yeah. Good. And I'll, I'll add to that. Um, you know, that you need to use your, your strength. You're, you're, you're from legal professional, think through the legal pain point. You know, what, what is the, what is it? The thing that so bother the industry, the users about legal, and there's so many, I can tell you, it's one of a very broken professional that is. Um, and, and really think to how can, how can be better the, with digital, right? The, don't just think of generic the problems, that you can't buy something, hey, what do I do with a start an import e-commerce business? I mean, that's, that's too generic, you know? The, any generic problems other people have, th have thought of, and they likely they're further ahead of you. In now today, when people get news very easily, you can really pick on your particular strength, right? And drill on it. Because the, your particular strength, others don't understand, right? Uh, and I'm absolutely sure that there's many, many things in the goal, you know, as simple things as get a, a you know, the documentations, legal documentations, right? The, in the most effective way. Um, right, getting the right lawyer, you know, something like that, you know, and, 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 and drew on. Thank you. Can I just, uh, uh, the pony, sorry to put you in the, in the spotlight again. How many people did you play around your idea with before you came and put your money in, or put your skin in the, in the game? I'm uh, sure. Before anyone mistaken, my name is Troy, not Pony. <laughs> you call me Pony too, but my real name is Troy. Yeah. Uh, so, um, a lot of people, uh, let's see, we begin it in a wrong way for the first six months. That's why we have zero revenue for like eight months. 
on the first six months, we kicked off our product right away without asking a lot of people, which is, yeah, which is not pretty cool. So, but we kicked off in a very cheap way. That's also how we impress venture capital as well. We don't have technology, we use Skype. We use Microsoft Excel to match the student and teacher. And we use mobile phone to call the student up. So that's three technology we have. Microsoft Excel, Skype, and mobile phone, right? And we try that for, for six months to sell that to the university, sell that to the corporate, that we were overconfident. But at least we get a lot of insight, and after that we sit down, we say, hey, maybe this is not working out. So we end up having a deep interview of about 72 people of a, what it would cause of why people learn English and why they're not learning with us. So we find out that you know, they do not do to be better in English, but they don't want to root face in the big class. Like this is a key thing that we find. So we do upper home promotion differently when we communicate to the customer. We say, hey, this is a place for you to make a mistake. This is not a place for you to be a super awesome English speaker, but at least, you know, this is what we get from interviewing people. Thank you. Um, yeah, would you, would you want to talk about the technical, because nobody touched upon the technical issue. She also asked about um, how, and this is a big problem in any startup, um, getting the technical aspect of it. I think a lot of us have faced it, all of us who have started something, getting the right technical person, which is impossible to do, except for him because he has loads of people from his parent company. Would you just shortly just talk, talk about the technical issue before I go to the gentleman's question there? So, okay, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that now. So one, you know, take the question a little further as well. Um, when it comes to technical person, a lot of it, when we first started out as a company, you know, any of us start out as a company, a lot of it is really going to our own network and finding the right person, finding the right technical co-founder to work with us, right? You must have a, it's a little like a marriage. Uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, ups and downs, and you want to make sure, you know, you date around a little bit, find the right person, before you commit into building a company with uh, him or her, right? And it's a very, very long journey. And I think, in, especially in Thailand, in Bangkok, there's actually a, a great number of technical talent uh, here, right in Bangkok itself, right? So Property Guru is setting up their office here. I have another friend who started a company called Garena, who you might have heard of. Uh, they have a very big engineering team uh, right here in Bangkok, right? So there's no lack of technical Talent. You can definitely find it um, within you know, the vicinity of like Bangkok itself. And I think the most important thing is figuring out what exactly is it that you want to build, what kind of uh, company, what's the product that you want to build, and look for that initial market testing, right? And make sure that that is the thing that you know you really want to build on. And a lot of people like to think that. You know, when you look at a company, whether it's Twilio or Property Guru or PayPal, you know, lots of other companies that I've mentioned, we look at it and look at it, wow, this company is successful 10 years from now, right? You know, 10 years ago when it started, uh, there's a saying that overnight success is 10 years in the making. And when they start, they actually had no clue a lot of times. Like, that was the thing that they really wanted to build, right? We look at a company like Airbnb, when it started, it was literally providing airbags in other people's house. They were not they didn't start out with the idea of I want I want to be you know the global platform, the global marketplace to connect travelers and hosts, right? That wasn't what they started with. PayPal, when they started, was a security company. It was an IT security company, solving you know security issues on the internet. And that became the underlying platform for money exchange. Right? If you look at a company like Slack, which I'm sure a lot of us use Slack, Slack was a gaming company. The product that Slack built was a communication, you know, messaging, internal enterprise software they, they use, that they use internally. And then they're like, okay, why don't we put it out there and see if people are using it. And people started using it. And today, they are the fastest growing SaaS cloud company uh, right now, right? And so, it's not like we all start out with the idea that we knew what we wanted to do. We, and there's also a saying that says, you know, a lot of times we write, we can write the best business plan. You can win every single business plan competition. And the moment you meet your first customer, that business plan is out of the window, right? And so the most important thing is really going out there, talk to your first customers, 
iterate your product and figure out what is it that you're trying to solve. What's the customer pain point, right? And if the customer pain point is real and the customer pain point is big, you will build a very successful customer business around that. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, sorry to keep you waiting, but yeah, it was a very interesting question. So I had to please go ahead and tell you how. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask students. Um, by the way, you, you told me that the system of DD property, and I'm one of the users that, that currently use DD property. Um, the thing is, I want to raise uh, maybe the question or the problem if, if I own a property, uh, a room in a condominium in the Tongwa district, this is just for example, um, and I look at your data, I study your data. Your data might say something like uh, if the price is 15,000, um, and I'm not very really content with that price. I renovate the whole room. I I really did like uh, renovate this room good and new, and I want to raise the price. And I haven't really logged in or becoming a user of DD property yet. I just want to do that. And um, how will you integrate my data without knowing me? Register into um, your profile data. Uh, this is my problem, and I have another problem for uh, Mr. Mo, uh, Kun Mo, uh, after this. So. I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. Is it around um, <coughs> the, the, the quality of the data you're seeing, or is it more around you don't know how to, to, to use it or not? So I misunderstood this. Raise the price of my own property up. Say I put my price at twenty-two thousand instead of fifteen thousand. Um, how will you know? And how will you know that? Hey, there's someone here that raising this price up, and this district maybe they should raise their price up as well. You know? Yeah, it's a good question. I guess the only way we would know that is if you were actually um, selling your property or giving property. That's the only way we can see the the, the price unless. Um, if it's not promoted there, it's not shown there, then we wouldn't know about it, I guess. Will you do lo local, like, a market research of a local studies of the property? No, well, we do. We have a we have an editorial and a content team which, um, as I said before, they, they, they publish you know, a number of articles every month around the property market. They'll do some analysis around you know, trends for asking prices and uh, rental prices and yield. Uh, by region, by neighborhood, and this kind of thing. We do that. Um, we don't go down to necessarily individual property in this case. So, um, so no. The challenge also is in, in many countries, including Thailand, is also even if there is a transaction, um, what's the real transaction price? There's a declared price, and then there's maybe a little bit of a Undeclared price. Yeah, undeclared price. Well. This is this is a problem um, with many markets, isn't it? It is. It is. And just, there's a lack of transparency, um, which makes it honestly harder for the consumer. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to use use data analytics to try and work out what is the the the, the rough asking price or price at the moment for, for example, in Thailand. Um, and the same in Indonesia, we have the same sort of challenge as well, to be frank. So we have, still have some issues, you know. So. Uh, the quality of the information is sometimes not there, as you mentioned. Um, not all the information is there yet. And so how do you really build that trust and confidence of the consumer if it's not there yet? And it's a challenge because uh, in many cases, people who are advertising or are putting information up don't care too much either about it. So this is something which we're trying to address, as I mentioned earlier on. We're trying to improve the quality of the data, improve the quality of the, um, uh, of the listings, uh, and also the response between the buyer and the seller. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks very much. And um, for Kun Mo, um, I see the Ubi, you know, the interface of your website is very clean, very user friendly, and um, it's, it's really nice to see the, the comics online. And I'm one of the readers. Uh, I like to read comics, but I don't usually read it online yet. But yes, that, that, that will change soon. soon. Um, by the way, how do you recommend the people to create a website? For example, you want to create a website to um, market your own product, you want to sell your own product. You, you start up a business and you want to create a website. Um, what would 
be your advice for for starting the website and you know you have to have all the necessary yeah. components yeah. like the credit card and everything and um the last thing is do you offer the service of setting up a website as well <laughs> yes yeah, yeah, i don't offer the service of uh, setting up a website but you can definitely find someone who we can do that. We have a we invest in one one startup, for example, which is called Fastwork. This is like a freelance marketplace where there are like hundreds of people who offer like a logo design, website design, everything. You can. You guys who want to do startup, you should definitely check that website out. And as a recommendation for for the website design, definitely I have a couple things. First, it have to be mobile first. So so 80, 90 percent of the users now say that they are using just their mobile phone to, to access your, your website. So definitely mobile first, it has to be really easy to use on, on the mobile phone. And the second thing, have to be SEO and S SEO friendly. That's the only thing you acquire your user. The reason that we are still doing website these days and trying to make it friendly is because no one gonna use your website, they, they cannot find your website unless it's when they search and it show up on, on Google. So you definitely have to have it mobile first and make sure that when someone search for the right keywords that you want to sell your products, it show up on the first page. So, so that's basic. Okay. And by doing that, you also have to integrate the analytics part, right? Google analytics or whatever analytics part you want to, in order to know that where is the traffic is coming from and is you are, are you growing every month, etc., etc. So yeah, three things. Yeah, thank you. As a, as the as the moderator here, I, I hope I have the right to ask the last question. Uh, you're already 15 or 20 minutes beyond our uh, limited time that we had. I'm gonna I'm gonna point this question to two people uh, on my right and the rightmost. Uh, I'll go with with Kun Panamat first, and then to Steve, uh, Kun Steve, uh, Mr. Steve. I think one of the most important things in my in my Good viewpoint. Oh, you know, I'm not that smart. Is leadership. I can see all of you here are pretty good at what you are doing. And it's a follow-up question to the lady there, the loyal lady. Sorry, I didn't get your name. Um, it's a. It's how important do you think is leadership to any successful startup? Does the guy have to be able to just go and say, "This is my product. Believe in it." If you don't, to hell with you. You know, if you don't, I'll go to a second investor, third investor, fourth investor. You believe in the product, or is that kind of attitude good, or is it that you tone down and say, okay, I'll take some notes, I will, I will change my product. How? What kind of leadership do you require uh, for as an if you go to an angel investor, to go to 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 even go to markets? What kind of leadership is required? I'll answer first because I'll, I'll leave Steve, who's more successful, probably more successful on this panel as the last person. Uh, leadership is extremely important, uh, obviously, especially in the startup environment. Uh, people don't really believe in your product just yet for the most part. They believe in you first. You know, why does the people want to come and work with you? Um, they may have no idea how's your dream, how's your visions will pan out. But in most cases, they say they believe in you, and therefore they'll try it out, okay? So leadership within an organization is extremely important. Um, now, in terms of the, um, your questions, interactions with investor and shareholders, I think the, um, you, the, the first person you need to answer to the most is obviously your target customer was the main point. Um, so many investor or some investor would provide valuable input uh, because they also think on behalf of users, then you do listen to them, right? Uh, many investors think purely in terms of return on investment and the flavor of the year or the month or whatever, then you just hear them, right? You don't need to be rude to them, but you just hear them and you can, you can think through and then you can ignore them. You don't you don't bend your dream because one investor and maybe the only investor in three months that say I'm about to write you a check if you change one, two, and three, right? Um, especially if they give you a very, very bad terms, you know? 
So I think the, always focusing on your end users, and if you the, do it well, in fact, if you do it really well, and investor will come to you. You will never look for need to look for investor. The, but if you need to look for investor because the, the, the your network may be small or people you don't know, then the, then select the ones that really buy into your vision. Kunmo seems to be smiling. It seems like he's the one who's saying, like, change this, change that. Sorry. <laughs> Please, Steven. You wanted to go first because you can answer the question. <laughs> I stole on my thunder. Uh, I'd say that uh, just from a personal point of view, uh, leadership is, um, is obviously critical, but I think in the early days of building business, the sheer passion, brute force, just getting things done, and the, the drive that creates has an effect of pulling people behind you and also pulling people to you. Uh, so I think um, in the early days, that gets you through. But as the business starts to scale, uh, that, that doesn't work anymore because the, the founder ends up being a bottleneck um, because everything has to go through them. And I, and I, I learned this uh, personally, you know, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist control freak. Um, so the first four or five years that works, and then over time it doesn't work anymore because you end up slowing, slowing the whole company down and you end up killing yourself because everything just goes to you. So that became critical in our case to then start to build a leadership team, and we tried to build a leadership team based on our culture and our values. And um, one of the key things for us was really around teamwork and also humility. And so humility basically means. Uh, if you make a mistake, you take responsibility and say, I screwed up. But also, if there's something good that's done, then the team takes all the credit. And um, it's straight out of you know, level five leadership, Stephen Curry, good for great. And that's one of our essential readings in probably good. And, we, and we, we try to do that. There has been a challenge, personally, as well as for business building leadership team, and going from founder led, just the founders doing everything, to suddenly building middle management, senior management. And then the senior management is getting pulled down into the nitty gritty of not really doing leadership well, uh, and then starting again to build a middle management place, uh, layer in place. And also, then from a personal point of view, in the last five months, then uh, you know handing over the CEO role. You know, it's, it's been a two-year planned process which has started with the previous board I had, and said that in two years' time, by the time my kids are five, I want to be out of the operational <laughs> and a bit more headspace. And, um, but that was one of the toughest things to do, to go through that process as well. And in terms of investors, um, what I try to encourage you know, companies I work with, in terms of early stage companies I work with, is investment is, a, is absolutely a two-way process. You know, the, the investor wants to potentially put money with you, but also you need to be comfortable working with them as well. And it's a two-way process. You know, it's not a case that they come along and say, I'll put money in it and I'll change this. And you say, yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's a, you, know, you, have to, you have to believe in your own product and your own company as well. And, and have a little bit of you know, confidence in your own conviction. Uh, and, uh, and find the best investor for you as well. Um, and in my experience, the best investors have absolutely no idea about how best to run your company and actually your product. You know that best, in many cases. They may have some ideas about how to scale a business, and how to grow a business, and how to develop strategy, how to do M&A, and how to maximize shareholder value. That's all really, really valuable stuff. Um, but uh, building the company and developing the product, you know, it's down to you, and as long as you are listening to your customer, you know, always listening to your customer, because as companies grow, they tend to sort of get further and further away from the customer. Just can remind yourself to just focus on that customer. So with that note, thank you very much for, from a unicorn. And hopefully, we learn something from the panelists, and hopefully, a lot of us who want to be unicorns try, including yourself, and more as well. Um, but with that, thank you very much to everybody, uh, and I'll hand it over. See.